Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. The conference, the theme of the conference is uh, Iran, accountability for atrocity crimes. And in the subtext of the conference theme, we see also a repeat of the word accountability and also time to end impunity. Now, on the 20th of November 1918, that's 106 years ago, after the end of the First World War, there was a meeting being held in the cabinet of the British government. The Prime Minister of the UK at the time, David Lloyd George, was presiding over the meeting. And an agenda for discussion was what to do about accountability. Many people around the world, especially in Europe that was devastated by the First World War, wanted accountability. Specifically, they wanted to try the Kaiser, the German emperor an all-powerful man at the time. Suddenly, before the First World War, he was one of the world's most powerful men. Suddenly, Europe's, continental Europe's most powerful man. So the question was, um, well, David Lloyd George's government, as well as the government of uh, France, led by, then by Premier Georges Clemenceau, wanted to have him prosecuted. But there was no precedent in international law for holding world leaders accountable for atrocity crimes at the time, let alone setting up an international tribunal to do the trial. So the question that David Lloyd George and his cabinet colleagues were debating was, what to do. We do want this thing to happen, but there is no international law that supports the proposition. In the meantime, in France, the same conversation was happening, and David Lloyd George was told in his cabinet that that discussion was happening in France, in Paris, and that the um, Premier Clemenceau said, yes, I want to see the Kaiser tried. Remember the significance of the, Trizer, the Kaiser here was the head of state, the most powerful man in Europe at the time. We want to see him tried, said Clemenceau, but because we are not sure what international law position is on it, Clemenceau said, I have tasked some leading French experts to study the question. So that was a report that was given to the cabinet of David Lloyd George on the 20th of November 1918. Lloyd George said, well, I too want to see the Kaiser tried. Um, about international law, we are making international law. And all we want is that it serves the needs of justice. The significance of that, you may be wondering, why is he telling this story? The significance of that is in we are making international law and we want to see it serve the needs of justice. The point was that it was leaders of state that made international law. That was what David Lloyd George was saying. And he signaled from then on that he, from England, and Clemenceau from France, 
were determined to change international law so that leaders of states, the most powerful leaders of states, can be held accountable when they are accused of international crimes. And they'll be held accountable before a judicial inquiry made up of panel of independent judges who will review the evidence and decide whether or not the accused person was guilty of a crime as charged. Now, um, it's timely that we are holding this conference today because in seven weeks, there's a book I've written on this subject. As I said, it's timely. I didn't plan my book to have this conference and talk about the book. But in seven weeks, there's a book um, I've written on it called End of Immunity that we published, End of Immunity. And I tell the story of, <laughs> it's on there. I tell that story in how it is that international law from 1919 till now has changed. So as to say, international law no longer recognizes the idea that anybody is above the law because they are heads of state. That debate happened, as I said, it was a non-starter of a discussion before 1918. You didn't even talk about it. It was off the table for discussion. But from 1918, 1919, two heads of government, one in the UK and one in France, decided to change that story. And that story was effectively changed when, at the end of the Second World War, we had trials, were called the Nuremberg Trials. And we had a document that's called the Charter of Nuremberg, basically the instrument under which the Nuremberg Tribunal was organized. That instrument, the Charter of the Nuremberg Tribunal, in Article 7, made it clear that heads of state no longer enjoyed immunity. The people will be held accountable. And on the basis of that, we had the Nuremberg Tribunal that tried all the surviving leaders of the Third Reich, of the Nazi regime. All of them were tried. No, the essence of when I said all the surviving leaders was because Hitler committed suicide just as the war was ending. But the organization to try all the surviving leaders had him in mind as the first person to be tried, but he couldn't be tried because he committed suicide. What did the Nuremberg Tribunal do next? They tried Grand Admiral Dönitz. Dönitz was the guy who took over as head of state of Germany from Hitler after Hitler's committed suicide. Dönitz was tried by the Nuremberg Tribunal. In other words, the head of state tried and everybody else tried. So the point of that is that was the beginning of the story of the end of immunity for heads of state, for leaders of government. The same trial happened in the Far East in Tokyo, where, again, with the exception of the emperor of Japan during the war, Emperor Hirohito, who was the only one not tried, all the surviving leadership of the J uh, Japanese imperial cabinet during the war were put to trial and tried for um, war crimes that were uh, held accountable for. So again, that is the beginning of the end, in, in essence, of immunity. And um, the Rwanda Tribunal, where I worked as a prosecutor, also tried everybody, senior leaders of that government. I happen to have had the, um, um, whatever I want to call it, honor or whatever, 
of being a trial team leader of Colonel Bagasura. Colonel Bagasura was the gentleman who was effective leader of Rwanda during the Rwandan genocide. He was put on trial. So was the Prime Minister of Rwanda at the time. You also know the story of the um, leader of Serbia, Milosevic, who was also tried. You know the story of Charles Taylor, the president of Liberia, who was tried before the Special Court for Sierra Leone. So the point I make with that is as of today, as we are standing here, international law does not recognize that anybody enjoys immunity because of the position they hold in any government, be that president, prime minister, or whatever. <laughs> so people who commit crimes or atrocities thinking that they are protected by their office are making a very serious miscalculation in that regard. Now, I move to another, I know we ha have to yield the, the podium for other colleagues. Uh, two more points I make and I leave you. Uh, the second point I'd like to make is the idea of a debate that we also hear uh, in the corridors of international law, international relations. That has to do with when you have a tribunal that has been set up under a treaty, an international agreement, some people tend to think, well, because we are not party to that treaty, that international agreement that set up this tribunal, because we are not a party to it, we did not sign it, what they do does not concern us, they cannot exercise jurisdiction over us. Again, that is a very, very serious mistake for anybody to make. Um, I cannot begin to explain the nitty gritty, the details of international law that makes it a serious mistake, but I can say this for now. In relation to the ICC, for example, specifically, that debate comes up a lot. Now, one short circuit, one way to get to the conclusions I'm trying to get at here is this. The ICC is made up of 124 states parties, including um, all of Europe, Western Europe in particular, uh, as well as most of Eastern Europe. We know that France, France is a prominent member of the ICC. Albania is a member of the ICC. Why is this important? Why do I talk about Albania? Why do I talk about France? Some of you might already have figured it out because this is where some of the activists of the MEK, PMOI, are, where they live. Now, the construct of international law and the Rome Statute in particular gives ICC jurisdiction over crimes that happen on member state of the Rome Statute. So if an international crime, crime against humanity is committed in Albania, ICC would have jurisdiction if Albania doesn't prosecute or investigate. If a crime against humanity is committed in France, ICC would have jurisdiction if France doesn't prosecute or investigate. The point then becomes any um, attack or violation of rights of the members of MEK in those countries to the point that the violation amounts to international criminal law, international crime, would be subject to something that the ICC will have jurisdiction over. So that's the second point I want to make. The third point, and I'll leave you, is um, Professor Raymond has done a magnificent job in his tenure as the special rapporteur. As was observed earlier, he had lifted the veil of silence on the discussion around what happened 
1988 in Iran and later. And his research and his um, writings, his reports, have now given members of the international community the authority, the license to discuss these questions and what needs to be done about them. So he deserves credit for that, and I, I give it to him. One of the points he makes in his last report, on which some scholars uh, will get into an argument about, and I'll give you in a minute what that is, where he said that uh, what happened in 1988 uh, can be characterized as genocide. Uh, some people have uh, debated that question now. My own view on the matter is that that is a very reasonable and credible analysis to make. It is possible to characterize that event as a genocide. I don't have the time to explain why now, so I thank you and leave it. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much to Judge Chile Ubo Osuji for your wealth of experience and wisdom here this afternoon.